Hi, welcome back to Introduction to Molecular Biology. So in this lecture, what we're going to be talking about is the second part of chapter one. So what this entails is the cell structure and function, an overview of that. And then we'll go on and talk about model organisms, what those are, and how they're used by molecular biologists to gain more information about how molecules work together to create life, which is molecular biology. So first off, we are going to look at cell structure and function. So cells are three-dimensional objects. So I think it's most useful to look at them in three dimensions instead of on a two-dimensional screen. So what we're going to do is we are going to first watch a video that includes a tour of a cartoon animal cell. So it's cartoon because it's not a real one, it's an artist rendition. Then what we'll be doing is we'll look at a video that contains a cartoon uh, plant cell tour. So again, not a real cell, uh, but an artistic version of a cell. Then after we look at those two, we're going to look at some actual uh, data, some images of r a real cell, and look at that three-dimensionally. So there are is a lot of detail in cell structure. And there are a lot of components of cells. So to help you identify which components you should know both the location of, the structure of, and the function of, I've made a table and then three diagrams for you. So we're going to just flip over to the study guide just to show you that. And then we'll come back to the actual tours. So in your study guide here, on the first page are the questions that you should be answering. So you should have answered the first seven uh, after the part one, and you'll answer the remaining through 11 for after this part two. After those questions on the following pages, what you'll see is one is a table. And in this table on the left-hand column here are all the components of the cells you need to know. So there is a list of them here. And then in the second column, you can then write down, does this component exist in plant cells? Does it exist in animal cells? Does it exist in prokaryotic cells? Which ones um, contain that component? And then in the last column, you'll put the function. So these are all of the cell components you need to know the function of. You also need to know where they're located and what they look like inside the cell. So to help you with that are the next three pages of the study guide. Let's just flip through. So here is an artist's drawing of an animal cell. And so you will take the list from that table that we just looked at and take those names and use them to label the components in this picture. You will also be labeling the components in this picture here, which is a plant cell, as you can tell by the huge vacuole and the chloroplast and the cell wall. And then the last image is of a prokaryotic cell. So you'll be labeling the components of the prokaryotic cell. OK. So now that we know what you're going to be looking out for when we're looking at these videos, the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, the cytosol, the nuclear envelope, the nucleus, the mitochondria, the chloroplast, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the lysosomes, the vacuole, the cell wall, the cytoskeleton, the vesicles, the chromosomes, and the Golgi apparatus. So we're going to be keeping an eye out for all of those things as we go through and first do our tour of the cartoon animal cell. Even if you're just studying, a lot of work is going on in your cells. Let's zoom down and check it out. We've arrived in the space between two cells. A sticky coat called the extracellular matrix holds the cells together. 
Each cell is surrounded by a flexible plasma membrane with an incredible number of projections, docking stations, and channels. Let's dive into one of these channels to enter a cell. Whoa, look at this place. These girders and cables make up the cytoskeleton, the structural framework of the cell. They also serve as tracks for transporting cargo from one place to another. All this activity in the cell requires energy in the form of ATP molecules, which are made here in the mitochondrion. Notice the outer membrane and the inner membrane with its numerous infoldings. Many of the molecules involved in making ATP are built into the inner membrane. All those folds increase the inner surface area, enabling more ATP to be made. Moving towards the nucleus, we pass by layers of internal membranes. The nucleus is enclosed by a double membrane called the nuclear envelope. Let's enter the nucleus through a pore. The nucleus houses the genetic material of the cell, DNA, which carries the blueprints for making the cell's proteins. Almost two meters of DNA is crammed inside the nucleus. How does it all fit? The DNA is wrapped around proteins like thread wrapped around spools. Look, this section of the DNA has unwound and a different protein has attached to the DNA. DNA is being used as a template to make mRNA. mRNA molecules travel from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, carrying the instructions for making specific proteins. In the cytoplasm, a ribosome clamps onto a strand of mRNA. The ribosome ratchets along the mRNA, building a new protein. Some proteins stay in the cytoplasm. Others, like this one, are processed in special compartments within the cell. Protein processing and certain other metabolic activities occur in the endomembrane system, the cell's network of internal membranes. The endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, is part of the endomembrane system. There are two types of ER, rough and smooth. Rough ER is covered with ribosomes. Smooth ER lacks ribosomes. Lipids are made in the smooth ER. Let's go inside the rough ER. Note that you can still see the ribosome on the outside surface. The ribosome is manufacturing a new protein, which continues to grow inside the ER. Completed proteins move to the edge of the rough ER and depart in a vesicle that buds off from the ER membrane. Some vesicles fuse with the Golgi apparatus, another component of the endomembrane system. In the Golgi, proteins undergo further processing. Finished proteins are then packaged in vesicles that pinch off from the Golgi and are transported along cytoskeleton tracks. Some vesicles bind with the plasma membrane, secreting their contents outside the cell. Other vesicles, called lysosomes, contain digestive enzymes. Here, a lysosome fuses with a worn-out mitochondrion and breaks it down. Each of the trillions of cells in your body is a dynamo of activity, requiring millions of ATPs every minute. But most people are unaware of all this activity in their cells. Okay, so that was our tour of the animal cell. Next, what we're going to do is look at a plant cell. So this will highlight some of the differences between the two types of cells. But both types of cells are eukaryotic cells, right? Animals, plants, um, fungi, and protists all make up eukaryotic cells. So <clears throat> now let's go on to the plant cell tour. Both animals and plants are made up of cells. Their cells have many features in common, but there are a few significant differences. Let's look inside a leaf to take a closer look at a plant cell. 
First, we encounter a protective cell wall outside the plasma membrane. The cell wall is made from strong cellulose fibrils. Once inside the plant cell, we see the large central vacuole, which regulates the composition of the cytoplasm, creates the internal pressure that is characteristic of plant cells, and stores various compounds produced by the cell. Plants make their own food by photosynthesis in chloroplasts. Light passes through the two membranes of the chloroplast and strikes these green disks where light energy is converted to chemical energy. The sugar molecules produced by photosynthesis can be made into other molecules or broken down for energy. When sugars produced by photosynthesis are broken down, their energy is used to make ATP in mitochondria. ATP powers the work of the plant cell. Most organelles, like mitochondria, are found in both plant cells and animal cells. So the next time you pass by a plant, remember that we have more in common than meets the eye. Okay, so those two tours brought you through an uh, animation cartoon version of the cell. What we're going to look at next is are some actual images of a cell and put into three dimensions so you can see really what a cell what a cell actually looks like. Um, so a little bit different than the uh, than the artist rendition that we just looked at. So we'll look at that next. High voltage electron microscopy allows three-dimensional imaging of a segment of this insulin secreting pancreatic cell. Relatively thick slices of the cell are viewed in the microscope from different angles, which allows us to reconstruct a three-dimensional image. Stepping through the image from the top reveals the complexity of cell structure. Focusing on the Golgi apparatus, individual membranes can be traced, and we can appreciate the size and shape of various compartments. Using these outlines, a computer can construct a three-dimensional model of the entire segment. Here we see the stacks of the Golgi apparatus, each traced in a different color. The cis-Golgi, where proteins are first delivered to the organelle, is light blue, and the trans-Golgi network, where they exit, is red. Shown in dark blue are the secretory vesicles into which insulin gets packaged after leaving the trans-Golgi network. Many little transport vesicles, shown in white, surround the Golgi apparatus. They transport cargo between the cisternae or back to the endoplasmic reticulum. When all the other organelles are combined into a single image, we can see the incredible crowding of organelles in the cytosol. Here, mitochondria and microtubules are colored green. Endoplasmic reticulum and ribosomes are shown in yellow. The purple organelles are probably endosomes. Given this apparent clutter, one cannot help but wonder how all these components work in synchrony to allow the cell to achieve its tasks. So now that you've seen in three dimensions what the cell looks like, I've also included some two-dimensional uh, images of what they look like. So here we have our prokaryotic cell. And as we said before, the prokaryotic cell um, includes everything inside the cell membrane as the cytoplasm. 
So all this stuff is the cytoplasm, and in the cytoplasm, no organelles, but there are ribosomes to make the proteins, and there is DNA. And the region that the DNA is located in is called the nucleoid. So it's not, no membrane around it, but just the floating naked DNA, that area is the nucleoid. So all cells have a uh, cell membrane, which is also called the plasma membrane. And prokaryotes also have that rigid structure around the outside that you saw in the video. And that is the cell wall. Now some prokaryotes will also have a capsule, but not all of them do. Also some prokaryotes will have a flagellum. Again, not all do. So this is your prokaryotic cell. And then we have our eukaryotic cells. And the two types of eukaryotic cells that we're looking at are, just like in the videos, plant and animal. So plant and animal cells, like all cells, have a cell membrane around the outside, also called the plasma membrane. Inside of that, there are many organelles. One of the organelles is the nucleus. And the outer part of the nucleus is called the nuclear envelope. So inside that nuclear envelope is, is the DNA. In between the cell membrane or the plasma membrane and the nuclear envelope, everything else is your cytoplasm. In that cytoplasm, since we're talking about a eukaryotic cell, we have organelles. In addition to other things like our ribosomes, which are represented by little dots. And there is also the cytoskeleton, those proteins providing the structure. So within the eukaryotic cell, uh, you have the endoplasmic reticulum, right? That is attached to the nucleus here. And this is where your uh, membrane associated proteins are, are made. And on that, and a plasmic reticulum, there are ribosomes. The ribosomes being the components that actually make the proteins. So where you have ribosomes, it looks rough, so it's called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Where there are no uh, ribosomes, it looks smooth, so it's called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Since there are no ribosomes here, no proteins can be made, right? So here, there are other functions going on, such as making lipids. So we have, and these are actually connected, your rough ER and your smooth ER. You can't see it in this picture, but they're connected. And the smooth ER is also connected to the nuclear envelope. Okay, so we have our endoplasmic reticulum, and then we also have here the Golgi the Golgi complex, also called the Golgi apparatus. This is uh, looks kind of like stacks of pancakes. And these stacks are not connected to each other. This is one way you can distinguish between the endoplasmic reticulum, where you have these stacks that are connected to each other um, and connected to the nucleus, and the Golgi apparatus, not connected to the nucleus, not connected to each other. The Golgi apparatus is a location where some proteins will come to be modified so they can have full functionality. And, um, <clears throat> and then also in your cell, another organelle that we have is the mitochondria. So you might remember that this is the energy producing component of the cell. So this is what does cellular, the main thing that does cellular respiration. So the main thing that takes that uh, glucose and converts it into ATP. So sometimes people remember it by the mighty mitochondria. Um, <clears throat> the other components that we have in here are we are ribosomes, like we said, and then where there aren't organelles, there is a liquid portion. portion. So it's kind of the consistency of salad dressing. Um, so not as uh, not as viscous as pure oil, but more viscous than water. And that is called the cytosol. So the cytosol is, you can think the cytosol is syrupy. So the cytosol is the liquid part. The cytoplasm includes 
these organelles in here. Okay, so those are things that are similar between uh, all eukaryotic cells, but we're looking at a plant cell, right? So there are some differences, right? We have this large vacuole. We also have the chloroplasts that convert the light energy into chemical energy in the form of glucose. And we also have outside of the plasma membrane a rigid cell wall. So those are the structures of your eukaryotic plant cell. And here are the structures of your eukaryotic cell that is an animal cell. You'll see many of them are the same. You will not see the cell wall. You do not see a large vacuole and you do not see uh, chloroplasts. What you do see in the animal that you don't see in the others are centrioles, and these help to organize some of the structural proteins, the microtubules. We'll talk a whole bunch more about centrioles later when we talk about uh, replication and cell division. Okay, so you have now a general overview of the different structures of your um, cells your prokaryotic cell, your eukaryotic cell. Within the eukaryotic cell, what makes the animal cell and the plant cell different? So now you can go back to your, <clears throat> your study guide and use those last four pages to make sure you can identify where the components are within the three types of cells and also what their functions are. Okay, so the second topic within this part two is model organisms. <clears throat> so what are model organisms? They're models. Anytime you use a model, you're using something that represents more than it is. So in this case, you are using one organism to represent many organisms. Or you can also say a model organism is a species used to study and understand biology. So. <clears throat> the reason that you can do this, we talked about in part one of the chapter one lecture. We said that cells are highly conserved, right? So what that means, just to remind you, is that the structures in cells are very similar from one species to another. Also, the processes or how things are done within cells is very similar from one thing, one species to another. So what that allows us to do is study one single type of cell or one type of organism and then take that knowledge and apply it to other organisms. So this is very important because it would take forever to study every single type of cell and every type of organism individually. So luckily, there are all these similarities, so we can do them. Um, we can do one and extrapolate to others. <clears throat> so in molecular biology and in biological research in general, cell biological research, there are uh, about six different model organisms that are highly, highly used more than any other. So one of them is a bacterium, and that's E. coli. Another is a yeast species and called Saccharomyces, so um, many types of Saccharomyces. Then there's also a plant model organism, the mustard plant called Arabidopsis. And then there is also a uh, worm species, a nematode called C. elegans and a fruit fly called Drosophila, and a mouse uh, with the scientific name of Mus musculus. So we're going to talk about each one of these individually and talk about how they're used and what they have unveiled, what they have shown us about how life happens. So first, let's look at the simplest and work our way up to the more complex. So the simplest is our prokaryote here, our bacterium E. coli. So here are some images of E. coli. They are rod shaped, as you see here, there's one, and here's a whole bunch of them. This one right here is actually dividing. And E. coli 
are prokaryotic and um, they are used to discover the very basic mechanisms common to all cells. So in part one, we talked about things that make us make something alive, right? E. coli is a great model to decipher how those things happen. It's alive, but it's very simple, so you can't, you won't get complicated um, and uh, sidetracked by all the complex things that can go on in a, u- a eukary- eukaryotic organism. So you can just look at the very basics in the prokaryote the E. coli. And as we go through the class, I'll show you and point out to you the things we know from E. coli, such as how proteins are made, right? E. coli has ribosomes, things like that. Um, And so the reason that we use E. coli is, one, it's not like humans where there's some kind of ethical issue with doing tests on them. Um, Also, they don't scream when you kill them. And they are very, very cheap and easy to use. They divide quickly. You can do all sorts of things with them and then throw them out because no one cares. So E. coli for basic mechanisms um, and because they're cheap and easy to use. So moving on to the next level of complexity is the model organism Saccharomyces. So Saccharomyces is basic yeast. And we have some images of the yeast here. And these are actually images, yeast are reproduced quite quite often and quickly. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is actually two yeast cells, um, the mother and then the budding daughter. And same with all of these, the bigger one is the mother, uh, the smaller one is the, the daughter. So. So yeast are great model organisms because they're eukaryotic. So they have more complexity than your prokaryote, your E. coli, right? You have all the organelles in there and you um, have a higher level of complexity. What they don't have are all the cells doing different things. They're unicellular. So they just have one cell making up one organism. So it keeps it more simple. And they're very good for discovering the functions of genes. So in uh, in humans, we do not know what about 40% of our genes actually do. So that's around 25,000 genes we have. No idea what they do. So... What geneticists do is they will take a gene and they'll remove one gene at a time and see what happens. Now, you can't do this in humans because some of our genes we need. So some of the times when you do that, you could kill someone. Not looked well upon. Yeast, who cares, right? So what people do with yeast is they can take these genes that are very, very similar to the human version and remove them one at a time and see what happens to the yeast. So doing that is called making a deletion, deleting the gene. They can also do mutations. So they can just take and change one part of a gene and see what happens functionally. So yeast are eukaryotes, simple eukaryotes, and they are great for discovering functions of genes because It's easy to just take out one and see what happens or mutate one, see what happens. These, like E. coli, are very cheap and easy to use, right? You've all used them. If you've done any baking whatsoever, you know, you put your yeast in, it rises. Um, They're easy to, to, to use. They're super cheap. You can get them at the grocery store. So this is a model organism that's great for looking at functions of genes and other basic processes specific to eukaryotes. So we have our E. coli as a model organism. Now we have our Saccharomyces as a model organism. Moving up in complexity, we have our Arabidopsis. So Arabidopsis, this is a simple mustard plant. And here you see just some basic pictures of what it looks like. 
And this is the model organism most used when looking at plants. So how do plants work? How do plant cells uh, function? Much of what is known about that has been discovered in Arabidopsis. And these Arabidopsis compared to yeast and E. coli are a pain in the neck. But compared to other plants, very easy and cheap. So that's why they're used. So we have our E. coli, our Saccharomyces, and our Arabidopsis as model organisms. But none of those allow us to look at how animals develop. And so the next organism really helps us do that. And this is called C. elegans. And it is a nematode or a round worm. So this is one of them right here in the upper right. In the bottom left here, you can see a whole bunch of them. So this is how it looks under the microscope. They're really small, small um, little worms. <clears throat> so the C. elegans, like we said, is eukaryotic and it's multicellular. And it is, although it's multicellular, it's not super complex. So one, so all of multicellular organisms, like we talked about in the last lecture, start from one cell, right? You have one general cell, then that cell divides, divides, and then those cells begin to differentiate or specialize and become specific types of cells. C. elegans does this. It starts with one cell, and at maturity, so when it gets the most number of cells it will have, it has only about a thousand regular cells. So a thousand cells, not including sperm and stuff like that. So that is very simple. A thousand, going from one to a thousand, is much easier to look at than, in the case of humans, going from one to trillions. So what C. elegans is looked at, used for is looking at how cells differentiate. How do cells specialize? How do they go from one general cell to many kinds of specific types of cells? It's much easier to track up to a thousand than trillions. And so you can see right here on the lower right hand side here, this just shows you um, the cells that are present in the different areas. And um, scientists know where every single cell goes and where it comes from. And so it's helpful in what is called developmental biology, how multicellular organisms develop. Or another way of saying that is understanding how cells differentiate. OK, so. We have our E. coli for the very basic uh, <clears throat> studies that are common to all cells. We have our Saccharomyces, cere our Saccharomyces, um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, cerevisiae is one type, um, our yeast or Saccharomyces, and that is good for very basic eukaryotic functions. We said like looking at what genes do. Then we have our Arabidopsis, which is our mustard plant, which is good for plant studies. Um, then we have our C. elegans, which is uh, a multicellular eukaryotic organism that's good for looking at development or cell differentiation. <clears throat> so there are two more model organisms we're going to talk about. One is called Drosophila, and this is a fruit fly. So if you've had fruit sitting around in your home, you have these little flies, it's those things. And here are a bunch of pictures of them here. <clears throat> and these are very helpful in doing genetic studies because they have chromosomes that are very similar to human chromosomes. So different types of organisms different types of animals have different ways of determining sex, right? Uh, male versus female. And flies, they're the same as us. They have XX and XY, same as us. So this and the fact that they have these chromosomes similar to ours make them a good model organism for looking at genetics and how things are inherited. 
So Drosophila have four chromosomes. So four strings of DNA with the proteins all on them. That's much easier to keep track of than the 46 chromosomes that humans have. So it's a great model organism, figure it out on the small scale in flies, and then extrapolate that information to humans. So they found all sorts of cool things with flies. Um, like they actually manipulated some genes and um, identified a gene that can uh, make male flies prefer male flies to female flies. All sorts of, all sorts of stuff like that. So Drosophila, they're good for um, genetic inheritance studies, um, right? How are the chromosomes passed down from one generation to the next? Um, and generations can mean cells. They can also mean whole organisms like uh, flies. <clears throat> okay, so we're getting more developed and closer to humans. The model organism that is most used to look at as a human model is Mus musculus, which is your little mousy here. <clears throat> now this is a good model organism for humans because it is a mammal. It's a simple mammal. So it has a lot in common with us um, in terms of reproduction, but also in terms with how we react to our environment. Um, specifically, it's used a lot for immunology. So how do we fight off infection? How, how do we uh, prevent uh, bacteria from taking us, taking us over? All of these things are studied in the mouse because they have a very similar immune system, immune system to us. The downside is they're expensive, right? It, you have to house the mice. They um, mice, since they're so similar to us, they have feeling. They have a nervous system, so you have to treat them well. Um, so there are downsides to decides to using mice, but they do help us um, test things that we cannot test directly on humans, like the basics of immunology. And also, they are the gold standard for drug approval. So before a drug can be tested on humans, it has to be tested by um, on rodents, so by on mice first. Um, and Another use of them is if from the Environmental Protection Agencies, chemicals have to also be tested on mice. So it's a nice alternative to testing things on humans since we don't like to put humans, i.e. ourselves, through um, undue pain and death. So our model organisms, again, these are organisms that we can use to study the biology or or molecular biology in them and then take that information and since the functions and the structures are conserved with all different species we can take information from that one model and then extrapolate and use that information to other understand other cells other organisms and again we the ones that we looked at most simplest was our E. coli then we um, looked at our Saccharomyces uh, we looked at the um, Arabidopsis for plants we looked at the Drosophila um, oh, we also looked at uh, our C. elegans and lastly our Mus musculus our mice so as we go through the course and we talk about some different, we'll be looking at different data sets, looking at some different experiments, we'll refer back to these model organisms that the studies were done in, and hopefully you'll remember why we're looking at them instead of maybe a different organism. So this concludes chapter one. So in this second part of chapter one, what we've done is we've looked at cell structures and functions and also at model organisms. So what I suggest you do now is to go back to the study guide and complete 
the questions 8 through 11 and use the table and those three diagrams to help you answer um, question 9. Then review all of, all of the material from chapter 1. Go back, review the stuff from part 1 and from part 2, and then do the homework. So use the homework as kind of an assessment of how much you actually learned, right? So you'll, you can sit down at your computer, look at the question, try to answer it on your own first. If you don't know what the answer is, then go back to your other materials and look it up. And note that one as one you need to study more of. Then go on to the second one and do the same thing. Try to answer them all first on your own and then go back and look at your materials. That way, you'll be preparing yourself for the exam that'll be coming up. Okay, thanks for joining me for part two of chapter one. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to contact me. And I will be speaking to you again soon as we jump into chapter two. Have a great day. Bye.